Pierre de Coubertin is known as the father of modern Olympics. Traumatized by the wars in the second half of the 19th century, this French aristocrat proposed his vision for peace, and sports would be the answer. In 1894 Paris, he organized the first Olympic Congress. Gentlemen, have not the telegraph, railroads, sea routes, and telephone done more to promote peace than all diplomatic treaties and conventions? I hope that athletics will do even better. For Baron de Coubertin, the first president of the International Olympic Committee, this athletic universalism was very much a matter of politics. His aim was for young men from upper classes to meet in stadiums, thus promoting an idea of international peace and cooperation. But his efforts came up against states and their use of the games as a demonstration of their power. With the beginning of the First World War, the arrival of fascism in the 20s, and Hitler's rise to power in 33, the games really took on a new dimension. We enter an Olympic clash of nations. There are political motivations that turn the games into a stand-in for war. Berlin, 1936. Despite numerous calls for a boycott or cancellation, the games went on in Germany, ultimately serving as a loudspeaker for the Nazi propaganda machine. From the 1950s onward, the IOC had to contend with a world divided into two blocks, and the political stance of the committee would remain an ongoing subject of debate. With the Cold War, it's completely different because it sets itself up as an arbiter between two great powers, America and the Soviet Union, the West and the East. With Moscow hosting in 1980 and Los Angeles in 1984, there were boycotts from both sides. I have given notice that the United States will not attend the Moscow Olympics unless the Soviet invasion forces are withdrawn from Afghanistan. Ex-judo champion Thierry Gray now a member of the Paris 2024 Organizing Committee, won a gold medal in Moscow, a half-hearted victory that might have never happened. France was undecided. Then all of a sudden, President Valéry Giscard d'Estaing said that France wouldn't be going to the Games after all. I was thinking of attending the Games, and then a fortnight ago, I didn't think I'd be going at all, and I'd just take a vacation instead. And now we're actually going to the Games. The French Olympic and Sporting Committee wound up going to the Games in the end. When I won, I didn't even get the French national anthem. I got the Olympic one instead. In this Cold War atmosphere, iconic moments of history emerged. We also remember Kozakiewicz, the high jumper who gave the so-called bras d'honneur gesture to the Moscow crowd. This Polish guy was really incredible. For a while, the IOC fought against athletes taking a political stand. In 1968, black American runners raised their fists in support of the civil rights movement. The committee's reaction was clear. IOC President Avery Brundage was a white supremacist billionaire from Chicago and called for their exclusion. They were banned for life from the Games. Today, they barely even appear in the Olympic Museum. They were never honoured, they never got their medals back. The IOC put the brakes on all social, societal and cultural developments. When it does move, it does so under pressure. Since the beginning of the modern Olympics, the IOC was reluctant to include women in the Games. Until Alice Mila, a pioneer in women's sports, lobbied for female athletes to be more included. She helped organize the first women's Olympiad in 1921. The IOC wanted to contain the development of women's sport. It kept a very, very low percentage of women for years and years, until 1970. The proportion of women was below 15% in the Olympic Games. In 96, for the first time in the Olympic Charter, the development of women's sport became part of the Olympic rules. Despite the conservative stance of the IOC in the face of a changing world, the Games became a mirror of international politics. Sometimes in tragic circumstances, like in 1972 Munich, when a Palestinian terrorist took 11 Israeli athletes hostage and murdered them. And at other times, the Games introduced the world to new states following independence or decolonization, like after the breakup of the former Yugoslavia. 
On the tennis court of the Olympic Games, Goran Ivanisevic, the split champion, is perhaps the only professional player to commit his sporting performance to the service of a new nation. The collapse of the Soviet Union gave way to a less polarized world. The event once again became an opportunity for nations to come together. The essence of the games, with their all-inclusive dimension, was really created in Seoul, where there were no boycotts at all, and we moved towards something magnificent, this melting pot of all these nations coming together. From the first NBA players participating in the games in 1992, to the solidarity at the closed-door pandemic Olympics in Tokyo, Kubeton's vision of sports as an instrument to promote peace continues on. But the conflict in Ukraine has shaken up this balance. And the question of whether or not Russian and Belarusian athletes will be present in Paris in 2024 will once again challenge the Olympic dream.